Thank you. And I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and the possibility to talk. So um, let us start. Uh, so this is the plan of the talk. I will speak about isometric deformations of surfaces. And there is a fantastic and mysterious thing called Tarbu Ris. And so I think just recently, a couple of years ago, it was uh, so somehow explained, demystified by Leonor Savianek from Lyon. Uh, but as it uh, often happens, so one miracle is explained by means of another miracle. So here, this is, uh, so these are the split octonions and the reality for split octonions. And so I give both. So I was really very, very much surprised to see split octonions in uh, this talk because that's probably the only second time that I, that I just need, that I meet this object. All right, so let's um, start with the definitions. Uh, so I will always consider a smooth manifold M. Um, not embedded anywhere, so just an abstract smooth manifold, right? And let P from M to Rn be an immersion. Uh, M is, can be at the moment just any dimension. And then this uh, map P uh, being an immersion that induces a Riemannian metric on M, right? Uh, and then uh, we define an isometric deformation of an immersion as a family of immersions that induces always the same dominion metric. So one can, uh, so that's a bit of a matter of taste. One can say, uh, let's consider a sub-manifold and consider uh, deformation of the sub-manifold. But uh, for me, it is more convenient to look at an abstract manifold and the family of immersions of this manifold. And uh, it will be not that general. Uh, so I will be looking only at surfaces. So uh, manifold M of dimension two and uh, immersions into R3. Right, so this is classical differential geometry, the questions that were popular in the 19th century. And uh, so a classical problem, which is also studied very much in the 19th century, this is um, so study and describe if it's possible non-trivial isometric deformations. Uh, so abbreviated ID, non-trivial isometric deformations of surfaces in the space. This is a very difficult problem because uh, this is a non-linear PDE. Um, so finding an isometric deformation. So it's, um, it's a PDE which involves the determinant of the Hessian. So that's mon mon pair type. Um, so it's difficult still one can give some uh, special examples. So like associated family of uh, minimal surfaces like catenoid helicoid family. Um, also developable surfaces, of course, they can be also can developed onto the plane in a continuous smooth way. Then uh, there is a theorem about rigidity of um, closed contact surfaces. If you have a closed contact surface with positive Gaussian curvature, well, actually you even don't need that. So just if you have a, so it's non negative Gaussian curvature, then it is, uh, it is rigid. It doesn't allow any isometric deformations. Uh, and this there is still an open problem um, if there are flexible non-convex uh, uh, closed surfaces. Yes, uh, so minimal surfaces they allow they can be deformed asymmetrically, but they are non-closed, right? So here this problem this is about closed surfaces. So something like a torus or a sphere which is non-convex. If somebody finds an example or rather maybe proves uh, rigidity that would be, um, so I think a very nice result. Um, the, this problem has also a discrete analog where instead of surfaces, you look at the at polyhedra. And in fact, instead of polyhedra, one can look just at graphs, which is a bit more general. And there also there are, um, that is a similar result that convex closed polyhedra are rigid, but, uh, there are also known examples of flexible non-convex polyhedra. So the uh, so Bricard has constructed sort of immersed polyhedra, which can be deformed and uh, Connelly and Steffen uh, embedded polyhedra. All right, so that's, um, but we will be not studying isometric deformations because that's too complicated. It's non-linear PDE. Let us linearize it. If you take a family of immersions, PT, then, uh, you can look at the derivative of this family. And this is a vector field. 
right? So every point X moves along a path PT of X, and we differentiate this uh, with respect to T and take uh, the derivative of the initial moment at time T equals zero. So that's a vector field. And uh, a simple computation shows that um, if PT is an isometric deformation, then this condition is satisfied. So here it is actually important to distinguish between P and Q because P is somehow the, um, P of T is a, well, P of X is a point, right? So there is this map P from the surface to, to the space and Q of, um, Q of X is a vector, um, right? Because this is a vector field. But we will see in a minute that actually it, there is no need to distinguish between the both. Both are maps to R3, right? So P is a map from M to R3 and Q is a map from M to R3. Okay, um, so then uh, let us turn this property of um, vector fields or velocity fields uh, into a definition. Uh, so we say just as, that there's a smooth map Q from M to R3 is an infinitesimal isometric deformation or IID. Uh, if uh, this condition is satisfied, dp uh, in the product dq is equal to zero. By which, so by this um, abbreviation, I mean that if you substitute any tangent vector vector to the surface, then you will get zero, right? So it is written, it is written here in the uh, expanded way. Um, okay, and there are also trivial infinitesimal isometric deformations similar to the, so when you move somehow the body as a rigid object, uh, move the surface as a rigid body, and uh, they are given by this formula. So the cross product, so this is somehow the rotation axis uh, and uh, translation vector. All right, and then of course the same questions appear. So how to describe and think, uh, all deformations of a surface and uh, so on. And here, uh, so here are some results. Um, well, first, if you um, take any um, Q with that property, so dp dq is equal to zero, then any deformation with this initial velocity has the property that the lengths are preserved in the first order. The derivative of every length is zero. Well, um, then the derivative of any ID is an IID just by definition, but the converse is not true. Not any uh, IID is the velocity of some isometric deformation. The examples are not very difficult. You can just take a plane and take a compactly supported uh, orthogonal field to that plane. Um, one can describe the IIDs of, a, of an open subset of a sphere. Uh, so these are, they correspond to minus two eigenfunctions of the spherical Laplacian. Actually the normal component of the IID on the sphere would be a, a minus two eigenfunction. And from the normal component, one can uh, reconstruct also the tangential component. Uh, closed convex surfaces are infinitesimally rigid, but and it is not known if uh, non convex closed surfaces are. Um, convex polyhedra, again, they are infinitesimally rigid, but um, non convex flexible ones are known, and it is more easy to construct infinitesimally flexible polyhedra than really flexible. So there are many more examples. Um, yes, and so you probably have already noticed the symmetry in the definition dp in the product dq is equal to zero. One can just exchange p and q so that if q is an immersion, then p is also an IID of q. So on this picture, you can now uh, exchange p and q, consider q as, a, as an immersion of m into the space and look and interpret p as a vector field. And then you get also an IID. So this is just one of the first, um, so wonderful things about the IIDs. Um, here is another one, which is, um, well, absolutely unbelievable, probably the first site. And flexibility is actually a projective notion. It is metric by definition because we speak about preserving the lengths in the first order, but uh, it turns out that, um, well, one can say if, if a surface is uh, infinitesimally rigid, then any, um, projective image of this surface is also in the rigid, or in a bit uh, more general way, that is a natural correspondence between IIDs of a surface and IIDs of any of its projective images. Um, in fact, well, to make it maybe more, um, well, to, 
impress you with that uh, even maybe more. So it's, it's good to, to give an example. So here is a um, discrete example. So because for the surfaces, it's, um, so it's more difficult to construct concrete examples. So if I take a graph uh, K3, which means, uh, so I have three points and another three points and I connect um, any of the first, so each of the first three with each of the other three. Um, and I now consider um, this as a bar and joint framework. So all these lines are rigid bars. Um, and uh, one can ask when is it infinitesimally flexible? It's, it looks quite rigid and there is one condition when it is, so necessary and sufficient condition for this to be uh, infinitesimally rigid is that these points lie on a conic. This uh, condition is, project is projectively invariant. Um, another example is in fact uh, the octahedron. So if you take an octahedron, um, I don't know that, if you take an octahedron, well, convex uh, octahedra are infinitesimally rigid by theorems that I mentioned. Um, and non-convex octahedra is infinitesimally flexible if and only if, um, if you take the black faces, I mean, the faces can be colored black and white in an octahedron, uh, then the planes intersect in a point. So that's a necessary and sufficient condition for infinitesimal flexibility. And it also implies that actually black faces meet if and only if the white faces meet. In the convex case, this is of course impossible for them to meet, but so that's again. Um, and this is again, of course, a projective statement, right? So planes intersect at the point, yeah. Dimension of the space of infinitesimal uh, deformations, yes. And so the dimension does not depend, so it doesn't change if you apply a projective transformation, right? But, also, but in the smooth case, the dimension is probably infinite. So if, if they exist, then um, okay, and um, right, so this is um, absolutely counterintuitive why this um, metrically defined notion is projectively invariant. I can give a sketch of the proof in the discrete case, and the discrete version is actually older, and it has appeared uh, actually as a short note by an engineer, uh, the name Venkine, so in, an, uh, in some British journal. And here say the, well, everybody knows that this is true and we, we can do that and, uh, and you get the proof. So it seems that at that time, um, really somehow people knew things that uh, not all of us uh, know at the present. So the, um, actually the idea of that proof is the following. Um, again, so in the case of graphs, um, one can give a static uh, formulation to the infinitesimal um, Deformation. So instead of this kinematic, these velocities, you can consider equilibrium loads. So which means at every point you act by some force, and the uh, framework tries to to respond to that uh, to that external load by uh, creating stresses in the in the bars. So if every equilibrium load can be resolved, then the uh, framework is infinitesimally rigid. And in fact, so there is the duality. So really the space of non-trivial IIDs, this is a vector space. This vector space is dual to the space of non dissolved equilibrium loads. And that makes already um, a fine invariance appear. Why, why, uh, since these loads and spaces, they are a fine object. So there you speak only about vectors and some, summing up the vectors. And then the next step is to interpret these um, forces um, as also in projective way. So the forces which um, appear in this definition of equilibrium loads, they are line bound forces. So these are not free vectors, but uh, you, can, you can move a vector only along its line of action. And such a forces, they have a projective interpretation. So by taking the, I mean, going one dimension up and taking uh, the exterior product of the point and the line of action. And, um, Resolution means uh, so really that, so a load is a set of forces. Uh, so set of vectors. So I will draw them as a really exterior acting vectors um, on every point. And uh, the resolution means uh, that in every edge, to every edge you associate a number and this number tells how with what um, somehow force this edge um, acts well. Um, so this number tells whether this edge is, uh, whether this edge pushes the points away or it uh, pulls it together. 
And the resolution means that at every point, uh, this of the uh, and the internal stresses vanishes. So that's the resolution. So um, somehow the formula would be Fi. So if I is a vertex, F the this force plus the sum of all j's. Um, and then here we put omega ij pi minus pj. Well, pi is actually the, the point, right? pi minus pj, this is the vector, um, the vector um, uh, pi pj. And these omega ij are the stresses. So this is the resolution. And so, as I said, this is already a linear uh, system of linear equations, and it shows that this is a finely invariant. Um, okay, then, well, but actually, I will give today another uh, explanation of the projective invariance, well, the one given by Bruno Sivenik. Um, okay, now that's the end of the first, third, first part of the talk. Are there questions to this part? Uh, no, uh, so usually not. So uh, the condition when it is really continuously flexible, I don't know exactly, but that should be uh, that that is something fairly degenerate. So this is only infinitesimal flexibility condition. But these things they are important. Well, they were at least important in engineering. So somehow making some things move. Um, okay, so now Dabus, this yeah. Uh, omega ij are some so are any numbers. So omega ij is a map. Uh, so somehow, um, so for any fi such that there is a certain condition, uh, there exist omega, well, omega ij's, these are real numbers. Um, so that's the condition of the um, uh, resolution, resolution of the load, right? So omega j's are numbers. Yes, right. They they must be symmetric. Yep. Omega j is equal to omega j i. Well, uh, mechanically, this means that um, so if omega is positive, well, I don't know if positive or negative, but in one case, it's uh, so these two points are pu pushed apart by the by the load, and in the other case, they are pulled together. So these are internal internal uh, stresses stresses in the framework. But well, so these are just numbers, and this is a vector. This is a vector. Okay, then um, the double this, the main object of this talk. Um, yes. So first, intuitively, how to well, I, I want to, to introduce the rotation field and the translation field of an IID. So now P is an immersion of a smooth surface. Q is an IID, and uh, the fact that it is an IID means that every tangent plane. So tangent plane at every point to the image of my surface is infinitesimally rotated and translated. So really as a rigid object. So that means, uh, so here's this definition. Um, for P and Q, there, there are um, two other vector fields, R and T, such that uh, these two equations hold. So the first equation tells us that uh, the point P of X uh, well, one should, so these are somehow maps without arguments here. So of course one should write P of X, small x, Q of X, small x, and, and there where you write DQ or you apply it to your some capital X to your tangent vector. Um, so Q is equal R cross P plus T, that means uh, um, vector field Q uh, looks like an infinitesimal rotation with the axis R and plus a translation by vector T. Right, but this is not enough because actually for every point you can find infinitely many pairs R and T where the vector Q uh, written like that. But together with the second equation, this becomes non trivial because the second equation tells that the tangent plane um, is moved, uh, so is rotated, is rotated around the axis R. Um, so if you take this definition, then, uh, then R and T are unique. So it is not written in the lemma, but R and and T are uniquely de defined, right? Um, so one can take it, uh, I mean, if the intuitive, if I was not able now to deliver the intuitive explanation, you can just take this definition as a, so in a formal way, 
And it's indeed uh, if and only if. So that is, if you define Q by, uh, by this formula, then uh, Q is an IID of P and uh, vice versa. If Q is an IID of P, then there, are unique, there is a unique pair R and P. Well, so what did we do? Uh, we have started with two maps, P and Q, from M to R P and obtained two other maps, R and T. It turns out that uh, T is an IID of R for the translation field is an IID of the rotation field. And besides, uh, well, they also have a rotation field and translation field. Any IID has a rotation translation and the rotation translation field are P and Q. So there is a symmetry between these pairs. And this is um, easy to prove. One just looks at the formulas and takes a derivative and uh, everything is all right. Um, okay, this is very nice, but let us now remember that uh, this Q is an ID of P, if then also P is an ID of Q. So actually we can now um, look at T and R and consider T as an ID of R and ask what is the rotation and the translation field of this pair, right? So we did it in the other order. We considered R as an ID of T and then we come back to PQ, but if, T is an ID of R, what will be the next pair? Uh, so in other words, we construct a sequence, PIQI, -I, uh, which is defined recursively in this way. And the whole theorem is that this sequence closes after six steps. So um, in total, you get six pairs of surfaces, 12 surfaces, and uh, so this is called uh, Darbo this of 12 surfaces. Um, so the name uh, was introduced by Robert Sauer, um, so then translated uh, into French and English. So a more modest name is just 12 surfaces of Darbo, but uh, so you will see that that's actually, so why is it called a uh, list? This will be shown on the next slide. So this is, a, um, so Darbo did it in his, um, so in his big book. So uh, this is contained there. And after uh, that, there were not, not actually many papers on this subject. So maybe half a dozen during the hundred years. So Eisenhardt at the beginning of 20th century is out and was in the middle of 20th century is a bit of um, maybe a couple of decades later. And uh, so today I will talk about the work which is uh, just two years old. So the one by Bruno Svenek. Okay, so uh, my goal will be to explain why, um, so why this closes after six steps. Good, so let us see. So here is the, uh, so this double this. So you see, I have put P1, P1 um, and joined them by a, a thick line. So in this uh, diagram, so each um, simple line is an IID. So P1, Q1 generate P2, Q2, then P3, Q3 and so on. And uh, besides this relation of being, uh, one being an IID of the other, there are various other relations. So let me, Sorry. yeah. Yes, exactly. So one involution uh, goes from PQ to RT, then it comes back and the other one is exchanging, yeah. So then there are uh, surfaces or well, maps connected. So isogauss means um, um, well, P and Q are isogauss if, uh, if their tension planes are parallel. So image of DP is equal to the image of DQ. So they are parallel at corresponding points. And besides, if you deform one by the other, so if you take P plus uh, T times Q, then uh, the Gaussian curvature does not change in the first order. Um, so DDT at T equals zero of the Gaussian curvature of this immersion is equal to zero. So this is isogauss. Uh, then the dotted line, it's the polar correspondence, well, which means that um, if, you take a, if you have a surface, so this is the origin, this is a point P, then what you do, you take uh, the, um, so somehow so that this product is equal uh, one, 
right? So this times that is equal to one, and then you consider the uh, envelope of those lines. And finally, there is also W correspondence. So this is um, uh, this is a bit more difficult. So uh, two surfaces are in a W correspondence if um, the so correspondence means that um, actually so there is a map between the two surfaces, and if you take the corresponding points. Uh, and join them by a line, then this line is tangent to both surfaces. And besides, the asymptotic lines on one surface uh, go to the asymptotic lines on the other surface by this map. Well, asymptotic lines are defined only for uh, negatively curved, so I, I'm not sure, but maybe uh, conjugate directions also go to conjugate directions. Um, all right, so that's then verbal this. So there are really a lot of different correspondences between the between uh, the surfaces in this um, collection. Okay, then uh, in fact, one can prove the double theorem by, by computation. So not a very simple one, but uh, somehow using all the definitions and uh, so doing the work, you arrive at the formulas for all the surfaces and you see that, that this closes eventually. So that is a direct proof. Um, Okay, but now let us try to to find other reasons why this works. Um, so first, the um, let us reformulate reformulate the uh, IID condition in a different way. Let us look at the following quadratic form on R eight. So I'm writing elements of R eight as x, s, y, t. X and y are vectors, and s and t are numbers. Then I consider x in a product y plus s times t. This is quadratic form of signature four four. So we get a projective quadric um, in R P seven, and it turns out so this is an observation by seven x that if q is an ID of p, well that's by definition if and only if dp dq is equal to zero. Uh, so this condition is equivalent to the following map phi. So phi is p one q and then minus an important p q. Then one sees that uh, the image lies in q, right? So if you if you uh, plug this in into the quadratic form, you get zero. So this is a map into the quadratic q, and the condition dp dq is equal to zero is equivalent to this being a null immersion. So that means the tangent planes are uh, totally isotropic. So actually, the question of finding uh, well, the IEDs, uh, these are just null immersions into all this quadric. Okay, and uh, this also immediately implies the projective invariance of infinitesimal flexibility because you can act uh, act on this quadric by GL4R uh, by applying uh, matrix A to the first four coordinates and matrix A inverse transpose to the last four coordinates. This preserves the quadric and um, this acts on P. So P is encoded, the immersion is encoded in the, in the first four coordinates. It transforms P projectively. All right. Um, then, um, yes, yeah, so some preparation for, uh, so for the proof that we'll do later. So this is, let us describe maximal flats in Q. So Q is a very interesting quadric because of the following. Um, we can, of course, write the quadratic form of signature four four in the following way. So this is um, x1 squared plus, well, this is four squares minus another four squares, right? So the norm of x1 squared is equal to the norm of x2 squared where x1, x2 actually elements of R4. Then what are the uh, maximal flats in this quadric? These are graphs of the uh, Euclidean isometries because uh, v and f of f, f of v they have the same norm that means that f is a map is an is an orthogonal matrix in o4 okay but then we can uh, determine the topological type of the space of um, of the space of flats of maximal flats so there are those which are, which are coming from s04 and those which are not coming from s04 but um, uh, uh, yeah, so topological type, let me, let me speak about that later. And so we have two sets of three flats, uh, the positive ones and the negative ones. And there is um, an incidence relation 
uh, there are three incidence relations. So one is between the points on the quadric and the positive flats. The other is between the points on the quadric and the negative flats. And the third one is between the positive and negative flats, where we say they are incident if their intersection is maximal. That is, has dimension two. And um, uh, theorem, so which will turn out to be almost equivalent to the uh, tarpo this, is that um, the symmetric group S3 acts on the product Q Q plus positive flats, Q minus negative flats by permuting the factors and preserving the incidence relations. So this is called the triality uh, in analogy to duality where you can exchange points and uh, lines and preserve the incidence relations. So here you can exchange three uh, classes of objects preserving the incidence. Uh, and yeah, so I wanted to say, um, Q plus, uh, these are the, these are, all right, so any flat, I mean, so three dimensional projective subspace corresponds to four dimensional, four dimensional linear subspace of R8, which is contained in our quadric. And I claim that these are the four dimensional subspaces in our quadric. Why, uh, so this is a, Four dimensional subspace. If F is any linear map, this is a four dimensional subspace, right? And for some special Fs, uh, this is a, this is contained in the quadric, namely for those where F is an orthogonal map, because then the norm of the norm of V squared minus the norm of F of V squared is equal to zero, so you are in the quadric. Well, and Q plus are those which correspond to F from S04. Q minus are the flats which correspond to S, to, to not S04, to the complement of S04. So this is like the lines on the hyperboloid where you have one family of lines and the other family of lines. So here it's a similar picture. Preserving orientation and non preserving orientation. So graphs, graphs of orientation preserving isometries and graphs of non orientation preserving isometries. Yeah. And also, I mean, two three flats can intersect along a two flat. Uh, so that's now deprojectivizing. This. That means you have uh, you have two Euclidean isometries which uh, coincide on a three dimensional subspace. And this is, I mean, uh, if you if you map a three dimensional subspace of R4 isometrically into R4, you can extend this in two ways. So up to a reflection in this, uh, in this one. So that's, it helps a little bit to understand the picture with flats of one type and the other type. Okay, yeah, so I, I also started to speak about the topological type actually. So this theorem also implies that Q is um, homeomorphic to Q plus. Actually it's uh, one can, um, see that they are both homomorphic to S3 plus S3 quotiented by plus minus one. Because you know the topological type of O4 and you know the topological type of aquatic here. All right, so this is the triality that one can permute the factors preserving the internet relation. I will also, and I will now also explain actually where this reality comes from. Again, explain this miracle by another miracle problem, but let's see how it works. Um, so uh, split octonions, what is this? Um, first, there is a modular notion of a composition algebra. This is an algebra. So everything will be real in this talk. So this is an algebra um, where the product is not necessarily commutative and even not necessarily associative, but um, the algebra must carry a non-degenerate quadratic form N, which is multiplicative. N of XY is equal N of X times N of Y. And it turns out that there are not so many composition algebras uh, by theorem of Hurwitz. Uh, they exist only in dimensions one, two, four, eight. Um, and the form is either positive definite or has a split signature. So this is, um, looks a bit like the theorem about division algebras, but this is a different theorem. And it is simpler probably. It was proved earlier by Hurwitz. Okay, uh, then only these dimensions and only uh, either positive definite or um, split signature. So let us list all of them. In dimension two, uh, these are the complex numbers and the split complex numbers. So those where the new unity squared is equal to one. Uh, quaternions, you know, quaternions, split quaternions is a very simple object. These are just two by two matrices. 
which you multiply as you usually multiply the matrices and where the norm is the determinant. The determinant is multiplicative. It is a quadratic form and it has signature two, two. Uh, so yes, if Hamilton would not go for positive definiteness, then they probably would do it faster. So then octonions um, and split octonions, uh, one can define split octonions by somehow multiplication table, um, or there are also other models. Um, and one of them you take two by two matrix plus L in your unity times another two by two matrix and you multiply these matrices. So this uh, combinations in some weird way. There is also another model, but in fact, you will not need any models in this talk. Let's just accept that uh, split octonions exist. Okay, um, split octonions, it's an algebra with a uh, quadratic form of signature four, four, but we have seen this signature just now, right now. Uh, so if you take split octonions of zero norm, then they are, this is exactly the quadratic Q that we had on the previous slides. Let us now look at the uh, left shift, so left multiplication, find multiplication. So they send, now by R8, I denote actually the split octonion. So this is a eight dimensional algebra. Um, and multiplication is the split octonion multiplication. Um, it turns out that um, if you take, um, so if you take Y uh, from the octonions and Y of norm zero, then the kernel of the left multiplication is a positive flat. And the kernel of the right multiplication by a zero norm element is a negative flat. This is not obvious, but this is some, some computation. In fact, the kernel of left multiplication by Y somehow corresponds to the image of the right multiplication by Y conjugate. Uh, Okay, and besides uh, another non-trivial result, uh, so the two, so one po a positive flat and the negative flat have a maximal intersection if and only if the product of the defining elements is equal to zero. Again, so let us just believe that. But uh, and if you do, then you uh, can prove uh, one part of the reality, namely, uh, if you take points on the quadric, positive flats, negative flats, and send this product um, to itself in the following way. To every point x, well, to I mean to x in uh, Q, you well, well, so just this map. So um, now every uh, element of each of these Qs is, corresponds to some element of Q, right? Because in the previous lemma we just identified identified Q plus with Q, right, and Q minus with Q. So if you cyclically permute this x x y z. Then this preserves the incidence relation. And this is simply because the incidence relation, they look so symmetric. What is the incidence between uh, X and kernel of LY? X is in the kernel of LY if Y times X is equal to zero. The incidence between X and uh, light multiplication by Z is X times Z equals zero. And by the previous lemma, the incidence between uh, these two kernels is, is, is Z times Y equals zero. So if you permute X, Y, Z cyclically, then the incidence relations are preserved. Uh, so this is only, this is a cyclic group, not S3. To get S3, you, might, you must use also the conjugation. Okay, now the, I'm going maybe too fast. So if you ask questions, then I it will be not that fast, but, but it's, it's up to you. Yeah, yes. So that's actually really one of the crucial points. So I could. I mean, many things here you should just believe. Uh, one can prove them by computation in some, in any model of split octonions, for example, right? Yeah. Um, here not, because here you have only products of two elements. Uh, and. Yes, but it's really, um, um, one should be careful when doing things with octonials. So associativity is not, not given. All right, uh, and now from this reality, let, so this is sort of algebraic reality. Let us now describe the differential, differential geometric reality. So let us recall that um, 
we somehow cooked up a null immersion uh, with surface into the into our quadric. Null immersion means that um, the image of every tangent plane is totally isotropic, but uh, the image of a tangent plane is two-dimensional, right? Because we have an immersion. And every two-dimensional flat lies in one positive and in one negative flat. All right, so then at every point we have a positive flat, but the space of positive flats is isomorphic to the space of points on the quadric. That means from um, any immersion, uh, you get to other maps. So if phi was a null immersion, then you construct the phi plus immersion in the following way. Um, at the point phi of x, you look at the unique positive flat, which contains the tangent plane, uh, and you send this uh, positive flat to Q, because we know that there is this uh, correspondence between the set of positive flats and the points on the quadric. And the same with phi minus. Okay, so from one immersion phi, you get to other maps, which are not necessarily immersions, but let us assume that they are also immersions. Uh, you get this phi plus and phi minus. And uh, uh, theorem, uh, so this phi plus and phi minus are also null maps. And besides, if they are immersions, then um, there is a psi, well, there is a cyclicity of order three. Uh, so phi plus plus, what does it mean? It means you have, we started with phi, constructed phi plus. Phi plus is again an immersion, well, immersion into Q. You can apply the plus construction again. It turns out you, you get phi minus. If you apply it to phi minus the plus construction again, then you are back to phi. So that means you are really cycling uh, between these three immersions by, by that. And the proof is uh, in some sense similar to what we had with x, y equals zero, y, z equals zero, z, x equals zero. Because here we have this, um, so I will not go into details here, but um, the condition, so these conditions, they are somehow equivalent to these. Um, and uh, by doing some work, you really get that um, the relations between this phi, phi plus, phi minus, they are, cyclic, they are cyclically symmetric. Um, and I mean, really, that this is uh, similar to what we had in the last line here, that these incidence relations, they are cyclically symmetric. In the same way, these differential um, relations, they are also uh, symmetric. And this implies that if you apply the plus construction three times, then you get, again, phi. And this is this is the double uh, for this actually. Although it's not completely clear, so here we have period three, and in Darbu, this we have period six. But uh, there is just one twist here. It's that well, again, doing some computation, uh, one sees that this phi plus construction from the previous slide. This is exactly it. It exactly gives you the rotation and translation field. But it gives you uh, it gives you in it gives them in a false order because we actually want to go from PQ to TR. So if you we use our notation PIQI, then from PI, so from this PIQI, you actually get QI plus one PI plus one in the wrong order, uh, and this makes um, uh, period six out of period three. So here is the list of all the uh, again of all the six pairs in the in the double list. So you see that at some point we, we come back to phi. So this is the first period three, but we get uh, somehow Q and P on the wrong place. And so here we get not one, but some other function. And so one has to make another um, three iterations and then you really get to um, something which then should coincide with P1, Q1. So then that's that's all, thank you. So, so, uh, so locally, this is not difficult if the surface has a constant uh, Gaussian curvature. I did not mention that, but uh, um, so this is a linear PDE. 
which is elliptical hyperbolic depending on whether the surface has positive Gaussian or negative Gaussian curvature. The problem is if um, it's if it uh, has changing um, um, if it changes the sign of Gaussian curvature. So then these mixed problems, as far as I know, they are complicated. But really, if you have just a piece of a surface, uh, so simply connected piece of a surface with positive Gaussian uh, curvature, then that's an elliptic PDE. So from piece of sphere, you yeah, mentioned that. Uh, so it's, um, well, actually. Uh, no, no, not, not real. Uh, solving this linear PDE doesn't help you to solve the nonlinear one. No. Ah. Physically, yes, but I don't, I think there, there are probably, uh, there is a description of some, of some uh, isometric deformations of the sphere, but that's quite complicated. So the, in, in the 19th century, they studied also deformations of quadrics, but I guess the space of deformations should be somehow infinite dimensional time. I don't think that all the deformations we described. But if you just take the convex and change the metric, the metric uh, the upper side, 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 the upper the lower part, uh, how do you know that the upper part is deformed? So that's. Uh, yeah, you know, you know. Mm -hmm. And also, how do you know that it is, defor that it is deformed in a smooth way? Uh, this, this is mm -hmm. Yes, but I also haven't seen this in, um, somehow implemented and, and explained. So I think there, there are. But it was for polytops, so that's uh, polytops are simpler. But yes, so that's a possible approach. So there is a, also a theory about. So this is wild problem. So if you have a metric on a sphere with positive Gaussian curvature, then there is a unique asymmetric embedding. So now what you can do, you somehow you have a piece, uh, you have a non-closed convex surface, and you somehow complete it to a closed smooth surface. And after that, you vary the metric on the, on the new piece. So on the piece that you have put in. And then by while theorem, you get a family of, uh, of uh, isometric embeddings. But uh, I, I also, I mean, I spoke about that idea to people and they said, oh, well, it's not, not, it's not that easy. So maybe somebody should. Yeah, uh, we, we should, I think. Uh, yes, so um, Zauer, so a German mathematician, so in the middle of 20th century, he also described a risk for polyhedral surfaces, but there um, uh, a problem is that the combinatorics of the surface changes to the dual combinatorics if you go to the rotation and translation field because the tangent planes, so to say, they are they sit not on the vertices but on the faces. So, right. So if you go from P Q to R T, then uh, R T is associated not to the vertices but to the faces, and. Um, but that's well, that's actually not a problem because you somehow after six steps, you, you come back. And also one can just uh, look at the quad surfaces. So those which are made of quadrilaterals and four quadrilaterals at, at every vertex. So this is written up, uh, but so I think it's, it is done, yeah. So uh, the look for the Infinitesimal. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Why you uh, consider, or you consider the higher So people did that, I'm, but I'm not a specialist on that. So what I know, so Sabitov uh, studied this higher order 
and also some people in Austria. Uh, but this, uh, but I'm not sure that this is well defined. So what is the second order? Because you know, second derivative is sometimes not un not uniquely defined. Um, on the other hand, but then then you must take not a vector field, but probably some vector field plus so some what is it called jet. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I so I, I I never I never did uh, did that so I but I think that's that's an interesting problem. Probably well probably one loses those nice things. There is no double this, but but maybe there is something else. Probably there is no projective invariance, but maybe there is some other invariance. Uh, the attraction of G2, I no, I, I mean, I cannot say anything. Because, I mean, so an ID is given by, uh, so by this formula, basically P1Q, I, I, don't, I don't know how G2 acts on the opinion, so that's, that's a problem. But uh, so maybe if, so, and anybody who knows can can maybe say if it if it can be extracted from this formula because right so uh, the null surface is um, phi it corresponds to an um, immersion and it's um, it's ID right and I don't know what the action does with that formula. Mm -hmm. 